And hello and welcome back to Laid Back Laidlaw. Today I have a tense body and really tight shoulders because I have been not taking care of myself for the past little while and I'm not in a great place physically. I haven't eaten today and I'm like, meh. But I'm happy to be here. We're in. We're doing another dev stream for the 5.19 content, which, as of the posting of this stream, you can still pre-order both Lyra's Guide to Retia and Lyra's Guide to Risk and Reward by following the link that is at the top of the screen, because the previous link was wrong. You can still pre-order books before we send them off to print, but once we send them off to print, numbers will be locked. So, please check out that shop, which has other things apart from the books, before it closes. Today we are doing a general review of the Sword Saint as per 5.19, and we are taking questions about the Sword Saint and the guide in general. We already have a bunch of them in here, we already have a bunch of people at home, and I'm gonna turn this boy on. Wha-pow! And I'm gonna turn the music back on. Ah. Thank you for joining me today, I am excited to dig into the content despite my ridiculous hunger I'll tell you what i'm hungry for questions those who are in the chat reminder you can use the ama command to redeem to uh, ask questions i will go through a chunk of them uh today might be a bit shorter than some of the other dev streams we will find out because we are only going over one class today and that class that we are going over is if I can get it to the right place. The Sword Saint. The Sword Saint. A class that was arguably the start of 5.19th edition in a weird way, because it was the first full class that I had ever made, for that I publicly released anyways. The Sword Saint is an alternative fighter, uh, or at least it fills the same general niche, uh, that has a generally Eastern feel to it, but not necessarily always. The Sword Saint is based in using a resource called Focus Points to use a number of abilities that change based on your subclasses. Uh, it is a highly Nova dependent class that is very much meant to get in there, do a lot of sparkly flashy things really fast, and then get out, but be generally useful as a frontline melee fighter, although it is not locked to melee combat as many of its subclasses do cause it to be reliant on defense or on ranged attacks, such as the Tomoe subclass. And today, we will be looking at its progression, a few of its subclasses, and answering questions about what has changed about it between its original inception many years ago and its inclusion in this guide, because it has gone through quite a few changes even before this guide happened. So, 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 I think it would probably be best if I went through what the class does and went through its main abilities, then took some questions uh, and answered some of the AMA questions. That way it gives people time to throw more in. And then we will go through some of the subclasses and take a dip into those, bounce back, do some more normal questions, probably finish them out, and then we'll see where things take us. I'm kind of shooting for Maybe an hour, hour and a half. But we'll see how things go. Also, as of this time, any of you who are backers, uh, through Backer Kit, we sent out today the completed, I mean, it's still the preview version, so it's still in black and white, but the preview version of Lyra's Guide to Retia. So if you want to get your full version, including all the story segments and whatnot, please bounce back and go into Backer Kit, find those, find your digital downloads, and feel free to grab them. Getting that document to that PDF to be under 250 megabytes, because that's Backerkit's limit, was difficult. But I did it anyways. Alrighty. So, the Sword Saint. Broad strokes. Uh, you can see on screen what its, uh, its progression is and such. Gonna move this out of my way. You can see on screen what its progression is. Um, its class features. It is a D10 hit die class. It starts with light and medium armor and shields, simple weapons, martial weapons, saving throws are strength and wisdom. Its skills, you choose three from acrobatics, athletics, deception, history, insight, intimidation, medicine, perception, or survival. And it is immediately talented with no tools. Meh, make this a bit bigger. Meh, even bigger. At first level, it gets focus channeling. 
This is where it starts to get its focus points immediately. The entire class basically revolves around a currency that is called focus points that are very akin to key points but from the monk. Uh, it's actually funny, I heard that in uh, the 2024 stuff, the monk stuff changed to be focus points, which we've been joking, they, they stole from us, but uh, obviously not, but, but I find that funny. Uh, you have a number of focus points equal to five, plus your level as a sword saint. Uh, each time you, you... There is technically a limit on how many you can spend per class. Or, per class. I am so out of it today. There's technically a limit on how many you can spend per turn, which is equal to half your sword saint level, rounded up, plus two. So if you're level one, for example, it would be three. Which is basically enough for you to use Dragon Surge. Um... The DC for your spellcasting ability, effectively, for all of your Sword Saint abilities, when it is called for, is based on Wisdom, although you will almost never need to... There's, it's very rare that you'll actually need to use it. You regain... Whenever you complete a long rest, you regain all your focus points, and when you complete a short rest, you regain half your focus points, round it up. Every Sword Saint starts with the following... Focus techniques. Focus technique uh, techniques. <laughs> Focus techniques. <laughs> Focus techniques are uh, the various techniques they use that cost focus points. Uh, some things are called focus techniques. Thumbs are not. Some some are not. I can't talk today. My gosh. There's two of these behind us. I've been able to do dev streams before. I'm a wonky little guy today, and I apologize. Uh, not all things that take fo uh, focus points are called focus techniques, but the term is used somewhat consistently. There are also some items you can get that can give you extra focus techniques. Those are described in Risk and Reward. I'm good! I'm doing it! We're good. The main ones that all, fo all Sword Saints get are Adept Moment, when you make a skill check with a skill that you have proficiency in, you spend focus points, and basically you get expertise in it. So, make a skill check, want to be better, do it. You have to do it uh, before you make the skill check, mind you. Cutting vertical, spend a focus point, take the disengage action as a bonus action. Falcon wing deflection, spend two focus points as a reaction uh, whenever you are targeted by a melee weapon, and you can increase your armor class by your, your proficiency bonus, which applies before you resolve that attack. Uh, the bonus lasts until the start of your next turn, so in a sense, it is a form of, uh, it is a form of shield. One change that happened to that one is it used to be, if I recall, actually no, this one didn't change in that regard. And I'm thinking of another thing. Uh, in order to use it, you have to be wielding a weapon that you're proficient with, uh, and use it as a reaction. The reason for this being the idea that you are deflecting, you are taking a defensive stance with a weapon. Uh, if you are restrained or knocked prone, you lose the bonus. Falter Fleeting. This one changed, I think, the most at the very end. As a bonus action, you can spend one focus point to move an additional number of feet equal to 10 times your proficiency bonus, as long as your movement speed isn't zero. So if something has reduced your movement speed to zero, you do not gain the benefit from this. But you can be like, bonus action, I move another 20 feet at first level. And if you are... Uh, if you are in the tier four, if you have a plus six proficiency bonus, you can be like, I get another 60 feet. I should note, for those of you out there, this does not increase your movement speed. An important part of this one is it lets you move an extra number of feet equal to this. It does not increase your movement speed. So if you dash, uh, it does not, the dash does not consider this. And Overwhelming Advance, which apart from Dragon Surge is everyone's favorite focus technique. When you miss a creature with a weapon attack, spend a focus point, roll a d20, uh, and replace your attack roll, roll result with it. You can do this even if you have disadvantage. So if you make an attack with disadvantage, you can do this, roll a single d20, and replace your attack roll with the new one. Those are the basic ones that come with all sword saints. So everyone can do that. Then there's Dragon Search. At second level, you can spend two focus points to take an additional action on your turn. It cannot be you, you this feature cannot be used twice or more during the same turn. Or on the same turn, you used another uh, feature that gives you an action, such as Action Search. And each time you use Dragon Surge, the number of focus points it costs increases by one until the next time you complete a shorter long rest. So you use it once, goes up to three. Use it twice, goes up to four. 
When you use Dragon Surge, your movement speed increases until the end of your turn by five feet times the number of focus points it costs. So the more times that you use it between rests, the more extra movement it's going to give you as well. Path of Devotion. Third level is where you choose your subclass, which is what that is. Each subclass is called a Path of Devotion. Uh, some of them are based on famous historic figures, some of them are based on uh, fictional historic figures, some of them are uh, based on pop culture figures, although those ones are being phased out a little bit. Um, not all of our previous subclasses were included in the guide because we only have so many page space, uh, uh, so much page space. Blech. You know when you got one thing and it's talking, and that fails you? Really, really tilts you. Really tilts you off to the side. Now, a laid back laid law stream, it's a knocked on his feet laid back fucking <laughs> laid law stream. Uh, ability score increases, they get the standard uh, ability score increases at 4th, 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level. They get extra attack at 5th level, as many melee classes normally do, and then at 13th level, they gain a 3rd attack, but they never gain a 4th unless one of their subclasses say they do. And then at 7th level... Oh, did I not include... Oh, oh no. It's a good thing we did this. Oh, sorry, no, I'm wrong. So, it may be confusing to some people who look at this, as it just confused me that fighting style advancement is in here, despite the fact that it never says you pick a fighting style. The reason for this is that most of the subclasses that come with the Sword Saint will give you a fighting style automatically, and then that is what you are supposed to advance. Uh, those of you who have been here for, for uh, previous dev streams, you know that the 5.19 system has an advanceable fighting style system, where each fighting style has three tiers, the basic one, the lesser one, and the uh, greater one, and maybe in the future I'll include another tier for each of them and expand on them. But for now it's got those ones. And you can advance those either by taking feats that advance them, or most classes that are uh, fighting style oriented have had uh, abilities built into them now, where at certain levels you get to advance them. The Sword Saint gets to advance their fighting styles on 7th, 10th, and 15th level. And if they do not have one they can advance, they choose a new one from archery, blind fighting, defense, dueling, great weapon fighting, gun expert, interception, proficiency polearm, proficiency two-handed, that's a typo, that's gotta be fixed, and two-weapon fighting. Heck in. They get a total, so since they get one normally, they get a total of one fighting style that will get all the way up to greater, and then a second one. If you take uh, feats and such to advance them in, in the uh, in between time, though, you can get more of them. Burgeoning Mastery, ninth level. Your your you uh, the long and short of this is you pick a saving throw that you're not proficient in, so you get a third saving throw of your choice. Saint Weapon Bond. Saw a question regarding this earlier that I may inadvertently answer just by addressing it. The idea is that you bond with a weapon that is a that is your choice. It's like your companion weapon. Uh, and I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time on this one because there's been in the past a lot of questions surrounding it and some things have changed, but I'll go over the general strokes first and then we'll get into the things that I want to emphasize. Uh, so 14th level, Saint Weapon Bond. You may attune yourself to a specific weapon of your choice. You perform a ritual to do so over the course of a short rest, uh, requiring incense and other materials that you can purchase for 500 gold pieces. You mix them together with a drop of your own blood. You effectively meditate upon the weapon for a small amount of time for the length of a short rest. The weapon changes hue to match that it has become synchronized with you, and it becomes your saint weapon. If you create another saint weapon, it breaks your connection with the first one. A saint weapon is treated as magical, and it gains the following benefits. If it requires ammunition, it can create that ammunition as it goes, but the ammunition is uh, unremarkable, that it is magical, and you have to reload it the same way you would reload a new one. So if you choose a gun to make as your saint weapon, you would be able to create bullets for it, but whenever it had to reload, you do have to reload it. Effectively, you can create a clip for it. If it's a thrown weapon, you can use a bonus action to call it back to your hands if it's within 100 feet, so you can throw it and be like, yeah, and bring it back. Snap it back to your hand. Throw it again. You gain a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls made with it. Attacks that it makes are magical. It did state it is a magical item. You no longer have a limit to the number of focus points you can spend each turn, but uh, 
If you have passed that limit and use a focus point technique that requires an attack roll, which, such as, for example, overwhelming advance, then it has to be made with that attack. Dragon Surge counts for this, by the way. And any benefits that would normally be gained from attuning to it. So, whenever you uh, attune to it, you gain these benefits, and this is one of the questions that's come up a lot in the past. People are like, do you have to attune to it separately if it's a magic item, for example? If it's a, a Holy Avenger, do you gain its normal benefits, or do you have to attune to it twice? Um, not to be reductive, when you attune to an item, you are attuned to that item. So anything in its text, no matter how many layers are adding onto it, that state that you have to be attuned to get them, you are attuned to it. There's not different types of attunements. It is collectively... You are attuned. Done. Uh, Soul of Lushu. Eight. Oh yes, the other thing, there's a couple other things I wanted to note about it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on, I saw a question asking how much of a long rest was, would be required to do this. Uh, it's over the course of a short rest. If you take a long rest, I, I as a GM would just hand wave it and be like, you can do it during it, no big deal. People have in the past been like, what if another creature picks it up and uses it? Do they gain the plus one bonus to attack and damage? And people have also asked, does that increase its, like if it's a plus one weapon, is it now plus two? Uh, the way to think about this is not that the weapon, the weapon itself does not do plus one attack and damage. Like if someone else picks it up and swings it, they do not get that bonus. The weapon itself does not go from plus one to plus two. The effect is that you get a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls that you make with it. You're the one generating that bonus, not the weapon. We've been getting that question since the Sword Saint came into being a long time ago, but it's not the weapon that has changed, it's you changed. You're proficient with it. Soul of Lushu. 18th level, when you complete a short rest, you get all your focus points back. And uh, you guys should know that our 5.19 system allows for very very rapid short rests, but you only get a limited amount per long rest. So you can just be like, okay guys, five minutes. Good, good to go. Got all my stuff back. But it's very, very late game that you get that full bonus. And then Unwavering Legend, which ties in with, uh, which ties in with the way that we do the dying rules. When you're reduced to zero hit points, you do not fall unconscious or begin dying. Instead, you continue acting as normal while making death saves as though dying, until you regain hit points and suffer a death save failure each time you take damage. Each time you would fail a death saving throw, you can spend one focus point to negate the failures. I will note to people that the reason that that is there is if you get critical hit. Uh, if you suffer a critical hit, you should suffer two uh, death saves, even in this state. You use one focus point and you negate both of them. So it's when you get hit, when you would fail a death save, use it, and any that you would gain from that instance of whatever did it, they don't happen. Well, in this state, you cannot regain focus points by any means. So, blue, uh, blue metal sword saints, you are not going to be doing super well when you're doing this. Thank you! Thank you, P uh, PJ. And those are the base features. Past there, there is a long laundry list of subclasses. But, so, effectively, as you can probably tell, they are... Very much melee fighter oriented. They're very much set up to have the customizability that our fighting style system, which I can touch on again today in the general questions if people want me to. Uh, they're very much set up to exploit that. Um, most people, when they take a first look at the Sword Saint, feel that it can do quite a bit. Historically, the feedback that we've gotten on it is it seems like they do... Uh, sometimes it's said too much, sometimes it just says a lot in combat or that they have a lot going on. But most people who have played them or seen them played generally see pretty quickly that they run out of focus points so quickly if you burn them too fast that any overwhelming advantages they have go away. So that the trick with a Sword Saint, and I'm not even good at this myself when I play Ajisai, uh, the trick with a Sword Saint is to pick your moments, pick when you really need them. We tried to mitigate the overburning of them like, Overwhelming Advance used to cost two focus points. We brought it back down to one because it... Sometimes you would have to... Early in the day, you'd have to pick, like, do I want a Dragon Surge or do I want Overwhelming Advance? And we wanted Overwhelming Advance to be able to stand a little bit more on its own, so it only takes the one. But, um... Yeah, their, their function is mostly pretty straightforward. There's no spell casting involved, unless a spell uh, subclass grants them that. 
However, most subclasses, slash basically all, like 95% of them, give you another set of usually three focus techniques right off the bat, and those usually determine how the subclass is meant to be handled. Before we dip into those, though, uh, I am going to go through and answer a bunch of the questions that you guys submitted. Heckin, where did I put that window? Here it is. All right. Question time. Do, 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 do. Actually, going back, uh, Captain Kojo, I saw that you said a thing without uh, doing the AMA thing. The throw weapon thing sounds rough because you have to have multi-attack, but only one bonus action. You can throw it twice one turn and then summon it back, but you can only throw it once because you already used your bonus action. That's not true. Well, you do have extra attack. You by you get extra attack because you have multi attack. I, I mean, I guess so. I mean, that's that's kind of like saying having extra utility is inconvenient because I don't have further extra utility. Because you could very much be like, I throw my weapon. Uh, let's say it's a spear. You throw it. You call it back. You throw it. And yes, it's gone, and you can't call it back immediately, but you could then, assumedly, begin moving towards it to try to grab it again. All right. Let's go through questions. Bop, 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 bop. So for bonding with the Sword Saint main weapon, does it take a long amount of time of a rest? It takes a full short rest. Uh, I think that's the question I inadvertently answered. Mark is complete. If we find any... Oh, that's about QA stuff for the guide. Uh, we currently don't have... We've, we've had a lot of people submitting um, what they think are grammar errors and spelling errors that aren't. So it's kind of a nebulous thing. We're doing another QA pass. The full question is if you guys find any spelling or grammar errors in the guide, should you submit them? Uh, you can submit them... I might open up a, a form specifically for those kind of submissions since we're going to close the playtesting one, like, very soon. Actually, could be as early as this week. But um, we're going to be doing final QA passes. The, the books aren't done done yet, so we still have to go through and uh, do those. Badoom. Is there a mechanic you wanted to try to implement for the Sword Saint that you just couldn't figure out? Yes and no. They used to have the spiritual armor feature. Um, the idea... They used to have a feature in older versions where you would spend a certain amount of focus points and you would gain a large chunk of temporary hit points, depending on how many you spent. And I initially, when I created the Sword Saint... Change up the music. Hold on. Wow. I initially wanted that feature to be part of it. I wanted the idea to be that they could like take a second and enter a state of spiritual awareness uh, and have extra defense. But that, that feature never really landed. It never really sold. And any attempt that I made to try to adjust it or make it stronger, not this one, make it stronger, uh, felt like it was leaning too far into being too constantly useful. So I ended up pulling it back and making it a part of, uh, making spiritual armor a focus technique that only some slash I think one right now, uh, subclass gets. I regret that I couldn't make that part of its core foundation, but I think it's better for not having it. I think it's one fewer distractions, um, when considering the options of a sword saint. Beyond that, not really. It's a, a heavy movement heavy Nova Point class that is at this point accomplishing when I've seen it exactly what I wanted to accomplish. So I think it's, I think it's, I mean, everything can be tweaked and depending on like the flavor a table wants, you can always tweak things to be a bit more in line with how they, how they play. But um, it's, it's being what I want it to be at this point. What's the deal with succession armaments and how would one go about start, uh, statting them? So succession armaments, that question is about uh, the information on Sermon Way from another part of the book and how there are idolic armaments that define their leaders. I cannot answer that question for you right now because you're basically asking me uh, to <laughs> talk about how a full supplement would work. They are individually relics that are outside the regular idolic arm specifications. So the only answer I can give you is basically build artifacts, build items the way that you normally would, 
based on your imagination. I cannot walk you through all of them because they are all supposed to be unique and special. There's not a template that can be slapped on them. No more than there is a template that works between the Vorpal Sword and the Hammer of Thunderbolts. Unfortunately. The pain of sometimes having a world that has a lot of highly specific items and ideas in it is that templates don't cover all of them. I guess I'll start with a simple one. Are there any new weapon types being added with the guide? And if so, what are they? Actually, you know what? I'm going to go down the list. I'm going to hit the Sword Saint-based ones, and then I'll bounce back around to the general ones afterwards. Saint Relics! Do you think that you will be releasing the Saint Relics for subclasses not present in the guide in the future, or are they being shelved for the time being? Let's take that as an opportunity to bounce over to Saint Relics. Which can be found in Risk and Reward, the companion book. If my brain worked. Saint Relics are artifact level items that can be used by anybody but they have particular abilities that pop off and turn on whenever you are a, uh, a sword saint of a specific subclass uh, and you make them into your saint weapon. For example, uh, Caliburn is for the Pendragon one. If you are a way of Pendragon sword saint and this is your saint weapon, then you gain the following benefits. All of them give you, well, almost all of them, but in general, they all give you two points up in one stat, one point up in another and they give you a small list of bonuses, most of which interact with your existing subclass abilities. Uh, the question being, are we, am I going to release ones for uh, examples of Sword Saint subclasses not released in the book, which I'm afraid to say, no. Um, moving forward, unless I do them as like little side supplementary things, which I don't have a lot of, I don't have that many spoons mentally these days to work on secondary things, um, so it's unlikely, but they, uh, we're, we're focusing from here on out on trying to support 5.19 as a system through larger supplements and have adopted the idea that you do not need anything that comes before what we made. So everything we make from here forward is going to have the 5.19 title in mind and is all going to try to be contained so that you can look at Lyra's guide and be like, that's where it starts. I only need from that forward. And that includes that any sword relics that we release in the future, they are going to be geared toward the, su the Sword Saint subclasses that are released in the books with them. But from now on, anytime we release a Sword Saint subclass, we're going to be releasing the Saint Relic to go with it, and old subclasses may be re-included as appropriate or retooled in future books, and if they are, they will then get their Saint Relics. But the thing is, a lot of the old subclasses also don't work in ways that absolutely get along with the way that we're building the Sword Saint now, so we'd rather build forward rather than patch back, if, if that makes sense. Mark is complete. Uh, since the game came out, have you thought of making a Sword Saint or Monk class based on Black, uh, black Myth Wukong? Not yet. Uh, gotta be real. For Sword Saint subclasses into the future, I am trying to have them all be more self-referential, I am going to be trying to aim to have them all be sort of more based on stuff in-universe, as opposed to drawing even from real-world inspirations, but not that Sun Wukong is a... You, you understand what I mean, real-world. It's a fictional character, but meh. Um, not ruling it out. Maybe. Maybe if inspiration strikes. The thing with Wukong, and I know I say this, having just brought up a Pendragon sword saint, is that if I do ones that are hyper, like, based on real or real or real fictional characters, uh, I want to avoid them being hyper-recognizable if I can, so I want to try to hide that under a veneer of fiction in Somnus Domina. And Wukong is so... Anything that resembles Wukong is so recognizable. So incredibly recognizable that it'd be hard to do. But maybe I'll think of something. Uh, let's see. Not caught up on Gilligan's Grave yet, but how do you feel about the change to your maximum focus points Sword Saint have had have now since release? How are your feelings on how the Sword Saints have evolved and changed since its initial concept as the Blue Metal Fighter subclass? What a journey it's taken, right? Uh, the Blue Metal... Well, it was originally... Okay. So, good is <laughs> the answer to the question. I'm very happy with how the Sword Saint has come, and... I still think that, how to put this, 
I think the Petal Knight is the best standalone class we've done so far because it has such a unique identity. But the Sword Saint, uh, every, there's usually one in every game. Uh, people seem to really enjoy the flavor of it. It's managed to be a fighter without being a fighter. Also, I've just accepted that I don't care if it replaces fighters, because whatever. Um, I think that it's come a long way in a very good way. I'm very happy with its evolution. I think it's found its identity as a full class. Uh, it's one of the main selling points of 5.19 stuff. Uh, it's usually the first thing that other sites steal when they start taking our content, which is a thing that we've been aware of happening a lot lately. To answer the maximum focus point issue, I think that was a really positive change. I think them having an extra five is good because the main issue was that Sword Saints were, it's okay if they run out of steam, but I noticed that with the changes we made at really early levels, they were running out of steam really quickly. There was like a couple dragon surges happening and then nothing. And that just didn't feel fun. There, there, is, there is a situation where you should feel like, oh, my character's out. Like spellcasters. You, warlocks, they cast all their spells. And they're like, well, guess I'm Eldritch Blasting. And they kind of accept that, but they have other things to keep the wheels turning. There's other mechanical grease. With the Sword Saint, you would see like a boss fight begin. And the preliminary stages, the Sword Saint would like be trying to get to the big bad. And they would find themselves running out of points and be like, well, I swing my weapon. And there's lots of fun to be had in swinging your weapon, but it didn't feel like it was really steering into what should be fun about playing the Sword Saint. And those extra five points, and the getting half back on short rests, they seem to have really steered it towards people feeling like they're remaining involved, both in the tables that I played uh, privately, in Gilligan's Grave. Sword Saints immediately feel like they're working better and having more fun, which is the point of D&D is to have fun without shutting down the game. So I'm really happy with the change. Quick. How did you come to design the Sword Saint and its subclasses? I know it was in response uh, slash for Spencer, but I'm more asking how, why mechanically. The original fighter subclass, I'm going to be real, was a Demon Slayer reference, which is why when you do Saint Weapon Bonds, they change color. The weapon changes color, which is actually a thing I think most people don't do. Uh, it was, Spencer and I were both big Demon Slayer fans, and I was just working ideas, and basically it was the idea, and if you remember, it also had, like, elements built into it a lot more originally, before that got kind of changed. Uh, Central Aura was removed. Uh, the reason for that is it, uh, yeah, it was supposed to be a big old Demon Slayer reference, and, uh, with a bunch of other sword anime and stuff tied into it. It's lost that, largely, and it's expanded out to be more of a uh, hyper-focused skill set sort of fighter class. But that was the original purpose. One second, please. Oh. Uh, I should have gotten a colder drink. As for its subclasses, when it stopped being a Demon Slayer reference, I kind of just took it as a way to be like, what if it was silly and what if I just made a bunch of references to, like, general things. Uh, initially, it started as me being, like... It got its name from the fact that I picked people who historically were called sword saints in different places, such as um, uh, Miyamoto Musashi and Sasuke Kojiro and other individuals who in Japanese history were referred to as sword saints. And then I just started being like, what if that expanded out to just recognizable ability sets? And then I started building it to suit those, and then over time I just found more and more threads that made it work a bit better, and I slowly started working away from historic figures and such. And we ended up where we did. Doop. Alright, I'm gonna do like three more, and then I'm gonna dive into uh, subclasses. Can you elaborate again as to the increase in focus points at the start? Oh, well that's what I just did. So... I'm not going to count that one. I had to double check Heavenbreaker for this one, but would you ever consider a Sword Saint subclass that subs out the wisdom score uh, for techniques for intelligence or charisma? I would consider it, but there has not been a need. And the, the class is built in such a way that um, nothing it does is actually flatly wisdom-based except its saving throw, but you can choose another stat later. So you can 
spec into that if you want to. But none of its abilities involve attacks or DCs by standard. So if, for example, Heavenbreaker uses charisma, I remember I had a, a semi-intense conversation with some people who tried to claim that it was relying on too many ability uh, ability scores. And the idea was that they're like, well, you, you are relying on your combat stats, usually strength, wisdom, and charisma. And my response to that, I'll actually go to, I'll tell you what, I'll bring up Heavenbreaker and we'll make that the first one we go over. Probably not the most fitting one we'll go over, but it's the one we'll go over. Um... It, the guy I had in the conversation, I'd just kind of curtly be like, what needs wisdom? Just spec into charisma. None of the, uh, none of the basic features of the Sword Saint actually require your wisdom be higher. So if you want to, as long as you know what you're going into, you could just spec into charisma to use it instead. Uh, as for, as to if I would consider having ones that used another stat instead... Maybe. It depends entirely on what I was trying to do, but again, I haven't seen the need yet. I'm open to anything that seems like it'll work in the moment, but, um... It, you know, when I'm making stuff, I usually just try to gear it towards what already works. I think anything that necessarily leaned more into intelligence or into charisma in a way that got in the way that needed to be changed over, it probably is just better suited for another class. Mm, boop. All right, one more, I think. Was that one or two? We'll say it was one. What subclass would you recommend a way of rebellion sword saint using a great sword switch over to in the update for the updated sword saint? Uh, asking for me and my DM sanity. Ah, uh, what one would I recommend? Dragonfly is good. Dragonfly keeps the same basic idea. Uh, they use, let's see, I think that Blasting Spear might not, yeah, it needs piercing damage. Um. Could do Gadabout. Could be a lazy bum. Heavenbreaker would probably be too much of a stylistic change. Oh, uh, maybe Kojiro. Kojiro can also, is based on two-handed, uh, weapons, so you would probably be able to lean into that pretty well. To the point that as you level up, it would be able to start using, uh, when it gets washing pole technique, you'd be able to use your two-handed weapon, your great sword, with one hand. Probably Kojiro. I know that one feels like it's more, like, related to spears, but it's not. Muramasa, also, but that one comes with a bunch of role-playing context. Pendragon could work as well, depending on your defense. I would say Kojiro would be the one to go. Alright, one more question and then we will look at stuff. Are, were there any of any subclasses or features that you wanted to make but couldn't because it was too difficult or confusing? Oh, I have so many. I have so many multi-step ideas that would be impossible to explain that in my head I'm like, oh, it'd be so cool to have a whole setup class where you spend five turns in combat hitting people in different ways and then if you hit them five different ways and you put five different effects on them then you get one hit that's an auto crit that'd be so cool in concept but it's so frustratingly impossible to actually do when you're playing i have so many of those um heckin so but they, they all sort of die as soon as i realize that once anything i do involves a third step in combat i ditch it in general there's sometimes, uh, sometimes I will try to make them work, but usually if anything I'm doing involves setup that involves more than two steps, I usually just consider it won't work. Because combat in D&D in the, the current day and age very rarely goes into like three turns. And if it does, it's because something happened that caused an emergency that's going to distract you. So everything I make, I'm like, it has to be able to pop off in like two turns. Ideally, just go. Because circumstantial stuff can feel, in concept, like it's cinematic to imagine. Like, let's say, if I wanted to make uh, Soifan from Bleach as one of these, and I wanted to have a technique that the point of it was, uh, if you hit somebody, you can, let's say you have a Hunter's Mark equivalent that you can put on them, and then, just off the top of my head, her, her whole ability is about if you hit the same place again, then you kill them instantly. 
My brain's like, okay, a fun way to translate that idea is you hit a person, you put Hunter's Mark on them, let's say you spend two focus points, they're Hunter's Marked, that's fine. And then the caveat to the rule would be, if you roll the same attack roll result again, like if you hit, hit them with an 18, if you roll an 18 again, well, there's hunt, well, they're Hunter's Marked, then you automatically get a crit. That kind of thing sounds neat in concept, and that's the kind of stuff I would love to do. But A, a lot of time those cinematic things actually end up being really exploitable. Like what I just described obviously make crits way too easy, although it might work if it's a saint weapon, that's kind of vorpal. But like, outside the realm of concept, basing an ability on A, two steps, and B, such a specific result, would actually just lead to a lot of people being frustrated that their stuff's never turning on at the table, because bad luck strikes when you're trying to be cool. If you're like, if I roll the same thing twice, even one turn, uh, I could get an auto crit, then you're never gonna get it. You should at least plan to never get it. You'll at least never get it when it matters. You'll probably get it when you're fighting, heckin' eight goblins, and you're hitting the one that's got three hit points left. So, like, ideas like those, I'm like, oh, that sounds neat, that sounds fun, it sounds like, ooh, chance, random mechanics. But, um, it's not actually satisfying to do. When you imagine trying to play that, as opposed to imagining what it looks like, it wouldn't work. So that's the kind of stuff that I wish I could work in, but my mind's just like, nah, we're not gonna do that. Bah. All right. That's true, Arcane. It also adds the thing of you have to track what you hit everybody with, which inevitably leads to the DM being like, did you roll an 18 on that one? And you being like, yeah. And if it's a player you already don't trust a lot, you might be like, it might make you distrust them even if they're being honest, which is a really weird phenomenon. So I also try to not make abilities that add extra work for anybody. I want to add things that are very explicit. With the caveat of divination wizard style, like you took a rest, okay. Roll five dice, record them, you get to use those later. Because if your GM let you take that, they have to just accept that you're going to have to be held accountable by some stuff. All right. Changing the background track, let's look at a couple subclasses. We're going to start with one of the most inappropriate ones to start with. Heck in uh, Way of the Heaven Breaker, which is unambiguously a Gynax reference the character that we had designed for it, who actually is someone who I always had in my head as part of the history of Somnus Domina, but I never really had a reason to put to paper. Uh, they're tied to the history of DGRs and such. Um, they are explicitly a style over substance Gynex Gurn Lagan-esque reference. I'm gonna scroll down to them. Ask them. They don't explicitly look like any Gurn Lagan character at all. If you look at them for more than a few seconds, apart from the fact that they have a, a shade of blue that you would associate with Simone, nothing about them actually looks at all like a Gurren Lagann character, but I'm really happy with our artist that you can look at it and immediately be like, that is 100% a Gurren Lagann reference. Because the pose, but also just the energy of it is, ah, oh, prime. It's prime. It is the most gratuitous reference that we did. Uh, they're actually wearing a bunch of armor that was stolen from the remains of a monumental soldier, also included in the guide. But, uh, their abilities... So, third level. They actually get more in third level than a lot do. Boastful defense. When you're wearing no armor, you can choose to calculate your armor class as 10, plus your dexterity modder, plus uh, your charisma modifier. The idea there being that through sheer force of will, you are just lucky. You take ballsy moves, you step into a sword attack, shift one of your shoulders to the side, it just barely grazes you. That's the kind of idea. of You are just so intuitive in combat that you just happen to be dodging attacks. Uh, you gain the Reckless Fighter fighting style, which is very similar to the Reckless Attack uh, feature that Barbarians have, but with its own set of rules. Uh, we can go into that later if anyone leaves a question about it. And then it gets its three focus techniques. Um, some of them, sometimes some classes state that you can take focus techniques from other classes, and I've done my best to write in ones that do not get this. For example, if you are a Blue Metal Sword Saint, your GM can override this if they want to, but if you're a blue metal sword saint learning the techniques of other classes, you cannot take those from this one because they're so unique to its identity that it doesn't really make sense to see you doing them unless you are this whole package. They get Break the Vault, 
When you make a melee weapon attack against a target and miss, spend a focus point to roll a d4 and add it to the result, possibly changing it. Fun thing about that is you can use it alongside Overwhelming Advance if you want to, uh, so that you could roll a whole new one and also roll a d4. You can also do this a bunch of times. If your proficiency bonus is plus four, then you can do it up to four times at the same time, but you do have to uh, do it all at once, I would say. It's not explicitly stated, but if I was GMing, you have to be like, I'm going to burn three points. Actually, no. You know what? I thought about it. I wouldn't do that. I would absolutely let someone be like, no, it's still not high enough. Keep going. They're focus points. They can burn them. Carve your own path. When you have fewer than half your maximum hit points remaining, you can spend three focus points as a bonus action to add half your proficiency bonus, rounded down to all attack rolls, saving throws, and ability checks you make for the next minute. This bonus is suspended if you regain enough hit points to have more than half, though the duration will continue to count down. So if you go above half and you have half a minute left, you are still counting against that minute. Um, and then, But if you go back below half your hit points during that time, then you do that. So if you are in a perilous situation, you can grit your teeth and focus. And speaking of gritting your teeth, when one or more of your allies within 30 feet of you are stunned, frightened, or charmed, as a result of a failed saving throw, you can spend two focus points as an action to call out to them and let them re-roll the save against it uh, with advantage, ending it as uh, ending it immediately on a success. If you are within reach to touch any of them, those targets also add your charisma modifier. You don't have to punch them in the face to knock them out of it. But you should. But you should do that. <laughs> Hello, Mark Songs. We are currently doing a uh, QA stream for the 5.19 uh, supplement content from Lyra's Guide to Retia and Lyra's Guide to Risk and Reward. Kickstarted earlier this year, if you are unfamiliar with the content. You can check out the link that is at the top of the page if you want to... Uh, invest in those more. We are going over subclass rules, subclass uh, stuff regarding the Sword Saint, a class included in that uh, in that guide. Hello, it's me. I'm the creative director and writer of said book, of said over 1,200 pages of book. ba 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 Dumb luck. So at 6th level, they get dumb luck. When you roll a nat 1 on an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you treat it as if you rolled a 10 instead. Really self-explanatory. Uh, make the impossible possible. The thing we're currently going over, Mark, if you're new, is also an explicit Gurren Lagan reference, if this seems pointed. Uh, make the impossible possible. 11th level. Anytime you are forced to roll multiple dice as part of an, an attack ability or saving throw, such as when you have disadvantage, you spend two points, and you can choose any of the results. So if something gives you disadvantage, you can, be, you can spend two points and be like, actually, I'm going to take the higher one. <laughs> I've decided. And then uh, 14th level. 14th level is important for subclasses because it coincides with when you can make your saint weapon. So in almost all cases with sword saints, the 14th level feature involves the saint weapon in some way. Similarly, most of the saint weapons play into the 14th level feature in some way, and they can do it better, uh, do something with it better than if they had it in uh, random other people's hands. 14th level. When you're attuned to your saint weapon, you can make attacks with it against creatures who are within a range equal to your remaining movement speed, even if they're outside your reach. When you do, if that creature is outside your regular reach, you generate a burst of drill-like energy that carries you to the closest unoccupied space adjacent to them that is within range. The distance you travel is taken from your remaining movement speed. So basically, uh, if you have movement speed left on your turn, you're using your saint weapon, you can drill yourself, skedaddle on over in drill form to a space beside them, and then attack them. And depending on how much you have uh, movement speed-wise, you can just bounce around doing this. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, and when you attack a creature with your attuned saint weapon on your turn, your first hit against them deals force damage equal to half your sword saint level, which would be seven at this level, and go up accordingly as they level. And finally, not Giga Drill Break, Giga Helix! When you roll uh, at 17th level, which is the last level for features for the subclasses, when you roll a nat 20 on an attack, you can spend two focus points to deal an additional 8d12 force damage to your target as you channel a drill leg vortex of energy. When you do, you cannot use this feature again until the start of your next turn, so you cannot do it multiple times a turn. But all attacks made against you during that time, until the start of your next turn, have disadvantage. Furthermore, you can choose to use this feature on a regular hit without rolling a d20 by spending five focus points to do so. In both cases, the 
8d12, which is additional damage, uh, is not multiplied by critical hits, no matter which way you choose to activate it. And by the by, if you activate it via crit, um, you cannot do it using the spending points way until the start of your next turn, and vice versa. Those are, those are that one. A lot of flourish at the end. That's a big old finisher move, but that's also tier 4 gameplay, at which point most of the gloves should be off. Wizards are doing much more than that with individual spells, so if you want to burn points, <laughs> I, uh, I don't think you'd be doing anyone anything, doing any wrong by once per turn doing a big old attack like that, especially if it costs 5 focus points. That's that, uh, that's that particular one. Kem, Aethermancy, did the art for this. And they did a real good job. Look at that. I hope to do more of this character in the future, incidentally. I, uh... I would like to, at some point, get to expand on them, because there's a whole storyline involving the Heavenbreaker that, uh, is a little bit foundational to some of how I see certain elements of Somnus Domina and the history of DGRs. Specifically because it relates to things where the Eidolans weren't involved in the history of the setting. So in the future, I hope I get to do something with them. I'm kind of in a weird, I'd love to make a little visual novel involving them kind of space, but obviously I've only got so many spoons. Let's look at another... Let's look at two more. Actually, you know what? Let's take questions between them. Keep those going. We have nine questions left. Let's continue to bump down... Uh, so, what are your, what, uh, what reasons prompted the removal of spiritual armor as a class feature and instead be a subclass fo uh, focus technique for the eroded lord? I think I explained that earlier, but largely it just, it wasn't, it wasn't coming online as a core class feature. And by making it a subclass feature, I could give it a bit more juice because it would be more specifically tied into what that subclass was doing. If I gave it enough juice to come online as a general class feature, uh, it, uh, it it would just be too much. It already has so many things going on. Like most people already save most of their focus points for dragon surges, for example. Uh, so it functions better if it's a special thing that your subclass can do. Uh, was there any sort of unifying idea behind the abilities each subclass gains at the specific levels? Like, do all level 11 subclasses feature a specific design idea? Uh, so the general idea behind them is, at third level, if we're just talking basic, if we're not breaking the mold, uh, at third level, focus techniques and a fighting style. Those are what you should be getting there. Those will instruct players to kind of get what the class should be doing. The focus techniques should be a gesture towards how you kind of want them to play the character, how you want them to run the subclass. And the fighting style should supplement that and make it feel like it comes online better or works better or protects it. Uh, beyond that, the 14th level feature should be something that has to do with the saint weapon if possible, or at least should require a saint weapon. Everything else is sinew. Everything else is whatever flavor you come up with. Do, 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 do. What sort of subclass would you most want to be in real life? Gad about! And I wouldn't want to fight anyone. I want to be a lazy bum and not be in combat. Because in real life, I don't want to fight people. I, all, all the stuff in d d is geared towards doing violence on people and hurting them. And I don't want to do that. But if I'm going to give a more interesting uh, answer to the question, I would probably want... Definitely not Muramasa. I can tell you my least, the one I would choose the least, Muramasa. Um, I would say probably Eroded Lord. And the reason for that is they get to choose spells and cantrips. And it, if I didn't want to use my powers to hurt people, which I don't, then I could take spells that would let me do cool things, like Mage Hand, so I could reach across a room to grab a thing, or friends, so I could make people like the things I say. So <laughs> that's the one I would pick. Uh, and the, that and it would be solely so I could get a little bit of magic in my life. If I, try, if I try to imagine myself in a world where I'd have to use the abilities to hurt someone, I have already engaged with the part of my imagination that plays D&D, &D, at which point my answer becomes Tomoe. Because Tomoe is probably my favorite one, and I'm really psyched that Segi's playing it. 
What was your favorite subclass you've worked on in this guide? And the obvious question, which one slays the hardest? That is a broad as fuck question, because there's a lot of subclasses. If we only mean the Sword Saint, uh, my favorite one is Tomoe. The one that slays the hardest, I mean, just by sheer damage, is probably Muramasa. But it also has its drawbacks. Um, Musashi's also pretty good in that regard. Oh, Snow White Sleeve. But Tomoe is definitely my favorite. As for my favorite, I wonder if, could I even answer that question? Favorite subclass I made in the entire book. Hmm. Might be the Damocles Warlock, because the idea of having a companion mech is really cool. So I probably that one. If I was playing, if I had to, if I had to make a character, I had to play it. Um, I'd probably do that one. Sorry, I'm gonna mute my notifications because I keep getting, keep getting emails. Sorry about the, sorry about the noise. Do not disturb. Boom. We'll say that question's answered. With the new firearm reload rules from Loose Shoes and Retia's book, would it be correct for a GM to enhance and adjust the older Sword Saint Way of Rebellion subclass uh, ability ebony shot style regarding ranged attack since it was made before? Yeah, uh, if you want to do that, then go ahead. Um, anything that came up before the books, I before this book, I would say you'd have to, your GM should look at it and make sure it's compatible with modern stuff. Um... But, uh, yeah, the answer is just yes. Why does the way of Musashi not have any focus techniques? What? Why does the way of Musashi not have any, any other focus techniques? It has, it has these. They are dot hack menu noises. Do they mean do they mean Muramasa? They must mean, because it's the only one that doesn't. Uh, because Muramasa is based on um, the legends of Muramasa, of the weapons made by Muramasa, the, the demonic weapons in Japanese history that they were supposedly based on were weapons that would possess their wielders and send them into a frantic uh, blood frenzy. So this is kind of based on that idea of there's not as much technique behind this as much as just striking, just attacking. There's not, there, the people who took these blades up weren't, um, they weren't trained swordsmen necessarily. They could be, maybe, but they were more based on people who simply got lost in combat without the thought about technique. The mechanical reason is because the additional abilities that stack on top of criticals, uh, are already just passively so strong that it didn't, and it, like they get with their other features advancing how much damage their crits do and how much they get back, they kind of had enough. Um, they kind of already have enough going on that if there was extra techniques on top of it, it may not come online quite as well as it should. Also, they already they also spend focus points a lot in their abilities, and they get crits really easily, so it just didn't seem prudent to give them more. Boom. If somebody wanted to create their own Sword Saint subclass for their own table, is there any advice that you would give to make the process easier? What I said earlier for about the third level abilities being focus techniques and a fighting style, and then 14th being a saint weapon. Beyond that, uh, just remember that the point is that they should be um, dynamic. Most of their abilities are based around the idea of giving you more out of your actions. Uh, but they also should have kind of an exhaustion point that they hit and they stop. Beyond that, it's the same advice that anyone would give anyone for classes. Come up with a clear concept. Try not to have it do everything all at once. Uh, make sure it's not stepping on the toes of other classes and subclasses unless that is the intention. Unless your intention is I'm making a subclass that makes my sword saint into more of a sorcerer. In which case, do that, but don't make them into a full sorcerer. Make them into a sorcerer minus or a sorcerer who does sorcerer things in a lesser way than the sorcerer or a different way 
like if they had there's they, maybe they can cast fireball but maybe it's not a fireball maybe whenever they do attacks that require a saving throw they have to hit you physically and then they can cast the spell on that person as if they had failed to save and they take the damage um but maybe the range is limited maybe it can only be one target maybe they don't get anything resembling meta magic stuff like that Maybe they have to use their focus points or a focus point every time they do one. I'm kind of, I mean, a sorcerer sword saying it's just eroded lord. But you get what I mean. Um, just make sure your class is doing something fun, is doing it within the bounds of the system so that it doesn't feel like they're shutting down the game, and make sure that it doesn't outright replace another class. All right. Yeah. Arcane, uh, like the way of the progenitor was the Sword Saint Warlock, effectively, but they weren't, they didn't get all the same options a Warlock did. That'll be one that I want to remake in future. Now, remake or re-include in future stuff. All right, one more, then I'm going to do another class. Do you think there's any race class combo that represents 5.19 better than a Katsadria Sword Saint? I don't! When I was reading your question just now, I wasn't reading ahead. I thought the question was... Which was basically which one represents 5.19 best, and a Kitsadria Sword Saint was going to be my answer. <laughs> no, the, the Kitsadria Sword Saint is absolutely, like, the thing. Like, I gotta be real, if if Lyra wasn't so predominant, QB would basically be the, the, the representation of 5.19. In my mind, in a lot of ways, like, if I had to make a property, if I was, like, someone, if I have to make a show, like a six-episode OVA or something about Somnus Domina, I might make it about QB. <laughs> like, fucking this. This is what 5.19 is. Here it is right here. This is the entire system given life. Heck in. Boom. Let's look at another class. Let's look at one of the more traditional ones. Let's look at uh, Blue Metal. Where are you? Blue Metal is kind of special among them in that it is sort of the undecided, I want more versatility. I want to build my own Sword Saint in a way. It's based around steering into focus technique uses instead of having its own huge focus techniques to use. Uh, you know, like it does uh, focus mastery. It doesn't get a fighting style. That's the first thing that is noted. Uh, whenever you roll a d20 on an attack rolls d20 result, you regain focus points equal to your proficiency bonus. On subsequent 20 results, you only regain one if they're on the same turn. This is to prevent crits just purely by happenstance, refilling your focus points entirely and kind of busting a big fight. We had that happen with Spencer sometimes, and it didn't make me upset. I, like, I kind of like it when things like that happen. I, uh, I absolutely am just like, oh yeah, no, fucking neat, good, do it. However... My ability to shrug that off and my ability to understand that that was an exploit that shouldn't happen, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. So, like, if your proficiency bonus is plus five, you roll a 20, you get five points back. If you then roll another 20, you get one. And I'm sorry if that upsets any blue metal players, but you got six points back. And two crits. So, be happy, it's Christmas. <laughs> Then focus techniques. You learn two focus techniques, choosing from those of other Sword Saint Paths of Devotion. Each time, and I should note, at this time, that is meant to consider only the current ones in the guide. You can take them from old ones if you want, but just know that I don't, the 5.19 moving forward does not directly endorse that. Some of the old ones would probably be remade, like how we redid Grit, um, for example, but just be aware of that. Uh, each time you gain a level as a Sword Saint, you may switch one of these techniques out for another. So they don't get three but they can pick any two from anyone else that they want. Central Aura. Choose one of the following energy types. Cold, fire, lightning, poison. You attune to it. Uh, at any time you take damage of that type, you can spend two focus points as a reaction to negate the damage, then gain temporary hit points equal to the damage instead. You then gain resistance to that type of damage uh, for as long as you have those temporary hit points. So if you are like, mine is fire. And if a, a red dragon breathes fire on you, you can be like, actually, two points? You didn't do 86 damage to me. However, I have 86 temporary hit points, and for the remainder of the time I have those hit points, I am resistant to fire. So take that, red dragon. 
And then you may, as an action, spend two focus points to imbue a weapon you're wielding. Uh, I will note you do not have to have done the first part to do this part. You may, as an action, spend two focus points to imbue a weapon you're wielding with the same element you selected. So in that case, you can be like, two focus points. <laughs> My weapon is on fire. For ten minutes, they deal extra damage equal to half your sword saint level. So every hit you do, if you're a level ten sword saint, would do five extra fire damage for two focus points. Uh, extra focus. You learn two additional focus techniques as described by the blue metal focus feature. So up here, you get two more. So you have a total of four that every time you level, you can switch one out. Purity of form, 14th level. As long as you are attuned to your saint weapon, once again, saint weapon based, all of your focus techniques cost one fewer point to a minimum of one. If a focus technique involves a weapon or attack roll, it must utilize your we saint weapon for the to receive this benefit. Very straightforward. You're better at the stuff you do in general. I'll, for the Because we usually try to keep them between one and three, that'll usually mean that most focus techniques will then just cost one. But it also helps to mitigate Dragon Surge. Ro Speaking of, Roaring Dragon Surge! You can, 17th level, you can uh, use an advanced version of Dragon Surge. Uh, your regular use of Dragon Surge no longer costs extra focus points on subsequent uses. When you use your Dragon Surge, you can spend an additional focus point to make it into a Roaring Dragon Surge, uh, which causes you to gain advantage on weapon attacks with your Saint weapon until the start of your next turn. Those attacks deal an extra 1d10 damage of your weapon's type on a successful hit, and the amount of extra movement you gain when you Dragon Surge is increased to 30 feet when you use a Roaring Dragon Surge. So one drawback to this is that because the points don't go up, the amount of movement you get from Dragon Surge doesn't get to scale, but you can just be like, well, I'll just use an extra point and get 30 feet, which is the equivalent of six points. So, it evens out. I imagine most people would just be using the Roaring Ones. And that's Blue Metal. That's kind of like the iconic Sword Saint at this point. Heckin. But yeah, they, they're super... The cool thing about them is that as we add more Sword Saint subclasses, because they steal them from others, they will continue to be able to take them and use them for themselves. So all other Sword Saints are kind of an expansion to their toolkit. Although I encourage GMs to ask where would they be learning these? Um, where would they be finding them? And also, I would say that if you are... If you're familiar with them in Risk and Reward, we have an item... That is the... Where are you? We have the Manual of es Esoteric Techniques, which is an item that allows you to learn an additional technique by reading it until the next time you take a long rest or the next time you use this. I would say that if a blue metal sword saint got their hands on this and they gained a level and wanted to switch techniques, I would say that if they've learned it, if they've used it in the past, they could choose one from one of these. But I might say maybe only one depending on how it goes it's not baked into the text it's not baked into the mechanics but i would say that the blue metals whole deal is like i learn in, from other people i take from other people so i'd say that's a neat interaction that you could do 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 i'm gonna go through questions that popped up and then maybe do one more and then we'll see where things take us with the QB subclass, with it being based on the idea of QB being someone who could see a skill once and master it, uh, would you consider bending the rules a little for someone playing it to access the focus techniques that are exclusive to their subclass? Would you consider bending the rules a little for someone playing it to access the focus techniques that are exclusive to their subclass? Hmm. I might be being a bit dumb, but I'm not sure what that's asking. Um, are you in the chat? Could you... Oh, like, could it use ones that are locked behind the usual you can't use them? Um, like, for example, the Heaven Breakers. If your GM says yes, but the thing is a lot of the ones that are locked that way are either done so because they require something so specific. Um, like... They, they require the context of the class, or uh, they just, they're so less ingrained in technique, more ingrained in how you exist. That, like, for example, a lot of these are like force of will themed abilities, less than techniques. 
But if your GM thinks that's okay, then sure. I'd say maybe, though, you would have to see them in universe. You couldn't just pick them. You couldn't just be like, I want that one. Maybe you'd have to have some instance where in universe. Because we're talking about with Ars Magnus, right? Or Skill Steel. Um, hmm. I would say. Yeah, I think maybe you'd have to make the say that you encountered someone who used them. That way, you can have this idea of you saw them because they're so unique. That would sort of be my line. And if a player asked to do that, I would then probably intentionally put a subclass that they seem to be interested in. I'd put in an NPC in there somewhere who was kind of like that. Or I'd like, even if it wasn't a Heavenbreaker Sword Saint, I'd have someone who has like a similar ability to a Heavenbreaker Sword Saint so that they could make the point of being like, I saw them do this. What if I applied that to a technique? I would, I would find my way around it that way, but I would add context. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Mark to complete. I can't remember off the top of my head, but why does the Pendragon sixth ability, one of the only abilities that doesn't use focus points? I, let me review what you mean. Brave Assault, 6th level. When you make, take your first attack on your turn, you can use your bonus action to push forward, attacking with fervor. When you do, each time you make an attack, uh, weapon attack roll on your turn, you roll a d8 and add it to the result. Um, I mean, Instincts and Luck doesn't inherently take focus points. Are you just asking why is it a number per long rest one? It's entirely so that they can use their focus points on other things that matter, because this subclass as a whole, Hold Fast and Inspiring Call and Light of Hope are all kind of point sinks. They already take a lot of them. So that's there to A, be like, I'm going to use my bonus action to be really cool this turn. And B, it's it, you don't want everything to be on the same engine sometimes. Sometimes you want other things that it, you're kind of giving the player permission to be like, okay, you have a lot of cool things. I don't want you to always choose the one cool thing. I don't want you to always save up for your big Getsuka Tensho attack. I want to give you kind of a thing on the side to encourage you to have these other cool micro actions that you can take that don't take away from the big thing you want to do. Um, as long as it doesn't get excessive, I, ten, I, I find the 10 players that are playing fightery kind of classes can usually handle having... Uh, three or four types of resources to manage um like abilities to track or whatnot usually it'll be like a thing from their race a point uh sync from their class and then a couple of things that they get back on shorter long rests and then after that i find players start getting confused so that's kind of just one of those auxiliary ones Doop -a -doop -a -doo. Doop -a -doop -a -doo -doo. Where is my... There it is. What happened to the Sword Saint feats? They went away. They're gone. There's already enough built into stuff. Esoteric techniques. Items. They're gone. They're out of here. I found they were just a point of exploitation, and they were kind of already doing things that, like, the Blue Metal was doing. So, I just... Maybe I'll reintroduce them in some way in the future, but, uh... Nah, just wasn't vibing with them. Anytime they came up, it always just felt like a little too much over the top. Plus, the extra focus points that you got from them felt like it was... It felt like a better way to go to just give more focus points to the class as a whole than to be like, take this feat. Uh, plus, I would rather encourage people to take fighting styles through the new fighting style system than I would encourage them to take that. Class-based feats are fun. There's a lot of them in the guide already. Like, there's a whole bunch for the Petal Knight... Um, but I do find that when you make something like that, you are almost insisting to the player that they should definitely take it. And with the fighting style feats and whatnot, I just don't believe as strongly in them as I used to. Maybe I'll revisit them in the future. Fun question. How dare you? <laughs> They're all fun. What class feed options would you like to uh, take for maximum fox build? Race is obviously Kitsadria. The best I have so far is fox pack rogue Kitsadria, who has a magic initiative feat so they can cast find familiar to get a fox familiar. 
Uh, I mean, I would take, I would take ad- enough. I would probably take enough uh, fighting style advancements, so two that I could get a second fully developed fighting style, and tie that into whatever I was doing. Um, uh, talking about like maximum builds is hard because I build to flavor so much when I'm making my stuff. Um, so speed, probably mobile. I would try. I want to make them as fast as possible, so I'd probably take a uh, mobile so that they could move super quick. Are you, or is the question to get like the? Um, <laughs> It's not literally like maximum amount of foxes. Uh, oh, it is. That is the question. Okay. Um. Hmm. I mean, uh, I would do what I could to get the fox fire spell because it's themed as psychic foxes made of flame. Uh, I would then take levels in the QB Sword Saint alongside the Rogue. Uh, and then I would do the warlock, uh, the the first fox. Yeah, I think it's first fox uh, warlock. I'd multi-class, so I got all the fox ones. Uh, I would be a Cassadria. I would get fine familiar and make it a fox. And um, I would do, <laughs> yeah, I'd just multi-class to get all three of those. Get fox fire, get fine familiar, make it a fox. And then wear fox stuff. And then get polymorph so you could turn into a fox, but different. (laughs) Got two aerial marsh ones, and then we'll go to general questions. And do do do. On the topic of blue metal sword saints, was there at any point in development the idea of having multiple sword relics, such as Jigoku Saga being an alternative to Tenchi Saga? Uh, Yes. Kind of. Jigoku Saga is sort of the other saint relic for that path. Kinda. In a way. Um, but it's more of a flavor thing. The main the main issue with them is because they all give stat boosts. If you give multiple, a player might try to talk to the DM and be like, well, I'm only going to get to play Blue Metal once. I'd like to find both during the campaign, at which point you have to deal with the fact that they're going to probably spec around getting a full six extra points from their items and such. Uh, so I'd probably introduce a caveat that was, oh, but you can't only make one your saint weapon, so... I think alternative saint relics is a fun idea. I think maybe I only haven't entertained it so like to this day because I had so many artifacts to make already for the ones that exist. Maybe someday in the future if I ever do like a complete sword saint book that really dives into them and makes like NPCs based on sword saints and monsters based on sword saints, feats, spells and whatnot and really, really fleshes it out. Like make a hundred page book about sword saints. Maybe I'll steer into having multiple. But uh, complete blank style books are sort of back burner ideas for me right now. I have at least two more guides, the Exolunar one and the Kahulis one, that I want to do before I start trying to do that stuff. Plus, I think it would be disingenuous to make a, like, complete DGRs or complete frame units or complete Sword Saint before amassing enough content between guides that a compendium would make sense. But, uh, we'll see in the future. And finally, did you ever consider creating a fighting style that granted an amount of focus points and a technique or two, such as the fighting style that grants Battlemaster techniques? No. I'd have not. I had never thought about that until now. And my initial reaction is that, um, that might take some of the steam out of them uh so probably not i could probably talk myself into seeing how they'd be a good idea but i've already got items like one of the esoteric techniques that gives back so basically the idea is like in a vacuum outside of being a sword saint if i did this i'd probably have the fighting style not be available to sword saints so that they couldn't take it to get more focus points um but i don't I don't think I would want to do that because the only times I could imagine it really playing into much is, oh, I'm going back and forth. It's pinballing in my brain. Maybe, but I would probably make it only be the non-subclass based ones. Like for example, uh, I'd probably be like, you gain like 
three focus points. And you can use them. You, you gain three focus points and... Two of these. But the thing about that is if I did that... People would exclusively choose Overwhelming Advance and probably Falcon Wing Deflection because they're the most obvious choices. So it, by making that, I would probably be pigeonholing it into being like, you have to specifically do... You, it, it's only worth it if you specifically do these. So I don't like that idea because I don't like making things that look modular but aren't actually modular, that imply there is a correct choice. I'd have to think about it. I'd be open to the idea of workshopping it, but um, I am struggling to think of where the curve on it would be that would make it not just sort of an ex like an exploit. I might just be overthinking it. I gotta be real though, I'm actually not a huge fan of the feat that gives you Battlemaster techniques, personally. Um, so that's probably affecting my decision making. I, I think that that, if the battle master is something that not a lot of people seem to play from what I've seen, but if I was at a table and playing a battle master and someone took some of them, unless the context was that I like taught them to them, I, I would probably feel a little like, hey, get out of here, go do that somewhere else. Um, bum, 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 bum. And uh, boom. I figured I'd ask because Sword Saints. Well, we have a subclass in the Exolunar book. Yep. Absolutely. Probably two. And then we have one general question from a million years ago, which is, I guess I'll start with a simple one. Are there any new weapon types being added with a guide? If so, what are they? Uh, I presume that this is being asked by someone who hasn't opened the guide extensively so going down to where are they need to fix some of these typos in here uh, boom so yes uh, if by weapon types you mean just straight up weapons the bladed chain the bolus the combat gauntlets the combat knuckles the combat scythe the blasting dagger the great bow the great hammer the great shield the great scythe the gun blade the gun lance the hand cannon the mounted blades the revolver the light revolver the rapid revolver the rifle the hunting rifle the scoped rifle the siege garland the short spear and the twin blade all added all included here uh, as you heard, a bunch of firearms included in that list. Part of what we were trying to do was to uh, expand on firearms and make them more useful in an actual campaign, an actual game, because the 5e modular uh, optional firearm rules are, frankly, kind of useless. Um, and I've seen people try to do firearms a lot. Some people do good in some ways. Some people don't. They don't do good in other ways. We're probably the same way. There's probably a balancing act that we're not hitting for some people. But I really like what we've come up with so far. So... Firearms, BB! And then as far as all those go, they do include more properties, like cleaving. If you reduce a creature to zero hit points, uh, then you can choose another target within the weapon's range and make an additional attack roll against them. On a hit, they take whatever damage exceeded the original, and this can uh, go from one to another to another to another. I can't see this being a huge issue outside niche situations where it's just cool, so... Yes, it can chain infinitely, but it's limited to how many people are around you and how much damage did you do. This could help you get a lot of mileage out of a, out of a critical hit. Idolic, which that's just the weapon is idolic, which is a property like being magical. Firm, the weapon is secured to you. You have advantage on ability checks made to avoid being disarmed and aggressors have disadvantage on checks made to steal, remove, or disarm it. That's stuff like gauntlets that are like bound to your arms or things that are like secured to you by a chain. Knuckles. If they have a knuckle property, they can be used any time an unarmed strike would be called for. Uh, they uh, Also, any features that are considered unarmed strikes can be uh, applied to them. So the monk can get a lot of use out of that. And then secondary. The weapon has a second readied weapon, such as a blade on the other end of it, or a weighted end. When you attack with it, you can use your bonus action to make it a second attack with it, but the second attack has to use your dex. Ugh. Excuse me. And uh, those are, and then there's all of the firearm rules, which I might get into more in depth later, but there's a 
Heckin advanced, ammunition, bladed, burst fire, full reload, heavy reload, reload, sniping, trigger, trigger weapons. Want to do ruby? There you go. Do, do a ruby. Ruby time. RWBY time. And that is all of the questions that we currently have on the list. That wasn't up there, was it? When did that... When did that go down? Was that on screen a minute ago? I'm gonna scroll through. I just looked over my screen and realized that it wasn't uh, showing Adobe, so... This should have been up, right? I hope that was up when I was doing stuff. <laughs> okay, just went down just now. Okay, good, 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 good. Hang on, because I'm not looking over at the stream whenever I'm doing this. Do we have uh, any other questions that you guys want to put forward really quickly? I'll quickly look at the chat. I'd say we're at about an hour and a half. That's about how long I wanted to do stuff today, so that's a bit, bit fitting. Normally I'd be more for hanging out a lot longer, but I am so hungry. <laughs> I'm not eating at all today, and I w it's been almost 12 hours since I woke up, and I am... Oh, nah. Not in this book, Manny. Heck in. Not in this book. Do I have a do 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 do? Let's see. The Great Scythe with the Chain of Infinite Air, massive combo windows. <laughs> yeah. I love the Chain of Infinite Air. That kind of item, I think, has been made in a bunch of different supplements. It's like such an old staple to be like, what if you had a chain that made attacks but further? Again, where are you? Chain of Infinite Air. You want to do a Toji? You want to do a Toji from Jujutsu Kaisen? There you go. It's true, though. If you have a cleaving weapon that is attached to it, your, wep your range for cleaving does, by raw, increase ridiculously. But you are using an attunement slot to uh, to do that. Te well, no, not necessarily if you want to use the shorter range, but you can attune to it to make it truly bonkers. When will the non-VIP backers be listed in the book? Uh, what do you mean? Do you mean just the uh, the first ones? Because the only ones that are being mentioned are the ones who did the the backer one. They're listed here. Ba-boom. Heck in. You're listed there. VIP backers. Boom. Oh, sorry. Not, no, it's not you. But they're listed, uh, they're listed here. And then the VIP backers get their own page. Let's see. Oh, we just got a whole bunch of no... Uh, what are you going to eat after stream? Uh, yeah, Hello Fresh. Don't know which one. Do you have any idea in your head of why, of what Kitsune's normal humanoid form looks like? Absolutely do. What's your favorite kind of food? Uh, whatever I'm about to eat because I'm so hungry. Pickles, though. I love pickles. Anything with pickles. Pickles are so good. Uh, will there be another non VIP backers? I already did that one. Um, but, uh, favorite thing about, uh, favorite thing in the book is. Well, there's a lot of cool things in both of them. Depends on the day. Mostly, mechs. The fact that you can mechs. That DGRs. That I will probably at some point be planning a secondary campaign to replace things like DMS that is going to be more based on mech stuff. By the way, the next book is going to have a pilot subclass that is going to be... Or not subclass, just class. That is going to be geared toward being like, here's... Take this, give it to everyone... Include a lot of mechs. It's the don't worry about other classes class. It specializes in stuff to do with mechs. It's the mechs. It is Ace Anima. You're right. Ace Anima is the best thing about at least risk and reward. Um, but probably the mechs. And all the art. So much cool. So much hot. So much pretty. So much scary. I met so many cool people while doing this stuff. Um, but yeah. Heck in... I'm glad I got all of my indulgences into this book, because it is indulgent. 
in every possible way. There's the hot boys. Oh, look at the hot boys. There's the hot ladies. Davis don't like clothes. There's the the hot lady. What up, Vestius? There's the cool mech. The, well, they're not mechs, but they're the cool constructs. There's... Where is it? They're the cool mechs. A few of them you guys wouldn't have seen actually by now because a bunch of these were done uh, after the last update, which we did send out a completely up-to-date book, by the way. Are they robots? Nope. Heckin'. Can we get the names ideas for some of the future sword saints? Nope. You'll get them when marketing's happening or when they come out. Will a full map be given out as an image file when the book's released? Yep. Other than the kits, what are some of your favorite races and thoughts when making them? The uh, Nephilim. The no, thoughts when making them is people need to learn that Nephilim aren't celestial. What are some of my favorites though, actually, if I'm being less silly? Um, 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 I was really happy to make the Minotaurs and the Merfolk because I made some corrections. Haddislim, because I was happy to un untether the Tiefling from the Tiefling. Uh, beyond that? I mean the Capihato. The Capihato are the best race. They would never tell that to the Kitsadria, but they are. If, the, if I notice that the questions are going to slowly devolve into food, I'm probably going to leave, because all that's doing is making me think about food. <laughs> so I know you guys are being funny. It is very funny to ask food questions, but all it's doing is reminding me of how hungry I am. So, yeah. thoughts on spicy pickles. Love them. There's a brand of spicy pickles in bags that I used to buy all the time. Love them. They're so good. They're huge. They're great. Love me a big spicy pickle. Love me a... Love me a spicy pick. Uh, and then, actually, on top of the previous question, will the art be made public, such as with Lucius Guide to Kitsadria? I have answered this many times before, but yes. There will be, with the digital release, there will be a zip file that is a folder of, not full size, but all of the art that's included, watermarked, uh, with little attribution thing in the corner. Uh, also, all the tokens will be released with them. We, we did state as much that that would be included uh, in the Kickstarters as well. With that, ha with that, I believe that's where we're gonna probably, I'm probably gonna take off, gonna end this. Uh, we're planning a lot of cool things for the next stuff. Uh, there's probably, I'm gonna keep doing these dev streams, but uh, once we get past the main classes, it's kind of difficult for me to think of topics to go over, because I don't necessarily wanna just do NPC reviews, because they're so subjective in how you handle them in games. Um, if I do subclass reviews, it's going to be popping in, reading features, popping out. So if anybody has any suggestions for things they'd like to see from dev streams that would give us a lot to chew on, uh, please find ways to reach out and uh, let me know. Tell me what you'd like to see. Beyond that, uh, YouTube side at least, that's going to be it for today's dev stream. Uh, please join us next time when, I don't know, fighting styles and feats. Did we do fighting styles already? I think we did actually last time, so maybe not those. Magic item review. D tell me what you want, frankly. Let me know. I'm always happy to hear back from you guys, and hearing back from people really helps me to get a sense of what people like and where things end up. So, we'll see you guys next time, YouTube and beyond. Oh, goodbye.